Hello everyone, and welcome back to the second lecture of our introductory course to quantum computing. Today is lecture two, and today we'll be talking about the qubit. So first, let's establish what a qubit really is. So a qubit is a two-level quantum mechanical system. This just means that um, it can have values of zero or one. A qubit is also the quantum equivalent of a classical bit. Uh, qubits literally translate to quantum bits, so they just are the, the quantum equivalent of a classical bit. Uh, third, qubits can take on values of 0, 1, and superposition. While superposition isn't uh, really a value, it's more of like a state. So you can think of them as qubits being able to take on three states, 0, 1, and superposition. And finally, qubits are the building blocks of quantum computers. And while they are the major part of quantum computers, uh, they are actually a really small component on like the physical quantum computer itself. And we can see an image on the right here of some qubits from IBM. So to represent qubits, there are two main ways. Uh, first is through Dirac or Braquet notation. And then the other is through uh, vector representation. First, let's talk about the Dirac notation. So in the Dirac or Braquet notation, we use these things called kets, which is like that line and the greater than symbol. We use that symbol uh, to represent quantum states. So here we have quantum state psi equals alpha times uh, quantum state zero or ket zero plus beta times ket one. And I'll go into what alpha and beta mean, but Basically, your uh, quantum state for a single qubit will be the probability of landing in state zero plus the quantum state plus the probability of landing in state one. Now let's talk about what the alpha and beta mean in Dirac notation. So in Dirac notation, alpha squared is the probability of collapsing into state zero, while beta squared is the probability of collapsing into state one. So uh, qubits, when they're measured, when they're in superposition, they have a probability of collapsing into each state. Uh, the qubit can collapse into zero and one, but if you have more than one qubit, there could be many different states that the, the multiple qubits could collapse into. Uh, with just one qubit, like I said, you can only collapse into zero and one, and alpha and beta, just square them and you'll get the probability of collapsing into zero and one respectively. Now let's talk about how we can represent qubits using vectors. So in vector representation, we still have the quantum state psi, and then that'll equal a vector with, uh, it'll equal a column vector with alpha and beta. Uh, alpha squared is still the probability of collapsing into state zero when the qubit is measured, and uh, beta squared is still the probability of collapsing into state one when measured. Something else to mention is that every qubit must satisfy this rule that alpha squared plus beta squared equals one. This is what we call normalization. In traditional probability, normalization is just the idea that every event, the probability of every event in your element, in your sample space, must add up to equal to one. And this is the same idea with qubits. Alpha squared is the probability of collapsing into state zero when measured, and beta squared is the probability that the qubit will collapse into state one when measured. So just add them up, because these are the only two possibilities for qubits when they're measured, and that should result in one all the time. Now I have some sample problems for you. Uh, you can take some time to compute on the left side, the compute the probability of collapsing into the zero state, and on the right side, compute the probability of collapsing into the one state. Uh, I'll let you pause the video now, and I'll go over the answers uh, on the next slide. All right, now here are the answers. So on the left side, we have the answers for uh, computing the probability of the qubit collapsing into state zero. And on the right side, we have the answers to the computing the probability that the qubit will collapse into state one. So for the state zero questions first, uh, the answer to the first one is 0 0.5 or 50%, and the answer to the second one is 0 0.25 or 25%. Uh, 
these answers were gained by just squaring the alpha value. So in the first question, the alpha value was 1 over square root of 2. So if you square that, you get 1 half or 50%. For the second one, the alpha value was 1 over square root of 4. And when you square that answer, you arrive at an answer of 1 fourth or 25%. Now on the right side, for the first one, the answer was still the same as the beta value for question one was still one over root two. But for the second question, the beta value was square root of three over square root of four. And, the, and when you square this value, you get three fourths or 75%. The block here is like another representation of the qubit. Uh, it gets really complicated, so I won't go into too much detail about the block sphere, but just know that classical bits can be only be at the top and the bottom of the sphere, so they can only be in state 0, which is at the top, and state 1, which is at the bottom. However, qubits can sort of be on at any point on the surface of this sphere, which sort of allows you to visualize how much more dynamic qubits can be compared to classical bits. Finally, let's end this lecture on talking about what really makes a good qubit. So there are three main qualities. There are obviously more, but I'll just talk about three of the main qualities that make up a good qubit. The first is that the qubit can maintain a quantum state for a long time. Currently, a lot of qubits can collapse very easily and very quickly because they are super sensitive to the environment. As a result, we can't perform as many quantum gate operations on them, making them not very useful for quantum computations. Secondly, uh, I alluded to this point in the first point, but uh, we want qubits to be able to perform quantum gate operations extremely quickly. Just like the first quality, performing quantum gate operations quickly will allow quantum computers to perform more operations and therefore execute more complex quantum circuits, algorithms, and solve more complex problems. Finally, we want, quantum, we want these qubits to be easily scalable. Our current quantum computers are quite small and they aren't very suitable for practical problems. We need very large quantum computers in order for our quantum computers to be applicable to real to be more applicable applicable to real world problems. As a result, we want qubits to be easily scalable so that we can we can easily create quantum computers with more and more qubits. So that's it for today's lecture. Uh, next lecture in lecture three, we'll be talking about superposition, which is one of the three main quantum mechanical phenomena that allow quantum computers to gain a quantum advantage. Have a nice day, everyone, and see you in the next, next lecture.